next guest tonight is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution who has advised three presidents on Russian and European policy. Her new book is There Is Nothing For You Here. Please welcome Fiona Hill. being here. As I said, uh, the book is There Is Nothing For You Here. Um, U U.S. intelligence officer in the Bush and Obama administrations, National Security Council senior director for European and Russian affairs, 2017 to 2019. Though most people here might recognize you first from your testimony in the <laughs> 2019 impeachment hearing. The first one. Yes, the OG. Yeah. Impeachment classic. Your former intelligence officer, um, it's been six days since Russia invaded Ukraine, and the EU has showed unprecedented unity in response to this. Um, what is most surprising to you about both the invasion and the response? Well, first of all, on the invasion, you know, sadly, what's been most surprising is that it's gone on for so long. Because we were told that it would be a very, very quick absolutely. lightning strike, take over the cities, and you, you thought that would be the same thing. Yeah, I think everybody did. Thinking about the preponderance of power that the Russians have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. um, notwithstanding the fact that the Ukrainian military is actually fairly capable, but, you know, when they're facing an invasion force of uh, almost 190,000 men with all of the state-of-the-art equipment that the Russians have got, we thought that they would have moved a lot faster. So we think, in part, that the Russians might have initially been trying to minimise casualties. And then in terms of what you said about the European response was, yes, we were pretty surprised by all of this as well. And I'm sure that Putin and the Russians have been quite surprised too because there was an assumption that, for example, that a lot of businesses in Europe would have been very reluctant to pull back from all their investments in Russia, given oil and gas and the dominance of the Russian energy sector in Europe, that sure. people would have thought, well, I don't want to freeze to death. You know, so um, it was very surprising to see major oil and gas companies, for example, pulling out of Russia along with all kinds of other um, businesses. So it's not just the government response, it's what everybody else has done on a, a level of business, commerce, and ordinary people. Well, so far, uh, there, uh, the government sanctions, uh, restricted airspace, banned Russia from SWIFT. They don't get yeah. to see the new Batman movie, as I was That's saying right. and, yeah. Andy earlier. What short of direct military uh, intervention can or should be done, in your opinion? Well, there's all kinds of things that we could be doing now, and I'm sure that a lot of these are under discussion. It's very difficult for us to do something about the airspace over Ukraine, because that would be seen as direct interference. But, look, we've closed airspace to uh, Russian commercial aircraft and also military aircraft. But there are humanitarian corridors that we might need to be establishing there because we've got hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who are, are basically fleeing into all of the neighbouring countries. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to have a lot of medical assistance on the, on the borders, you know, for example, because I can quite well imagine that we would start to be helping wounded Ukrainian uh, servicemen as well as civilians. And look, there's going to be an awful lot of assistance that's going to come in, not just to, for the refugees in places like Poland or Slovakia or the Baltic states or further afield in, um, in Europe. But you're starting to see people go in there to fight. And it's not just Ukrainians. I mean, Ukrainian ha Ukraine has an enormous number of heavyweight boxing champions of the world, including the mayor of Kiev. We've got two guys who Vitaly are... Vitaly Klitschko, yeah. Exactly. And his brother, who were there. And they've made this amazing you know, set of um, videos for social media. You've got the, uh, one of the current uh, reigning heavyweight boxing champions who's given up his prize fight to go back. But you've got all kinds of people from around Europe now saying, I want to go in there and do something to help the Ukrainians, which is not something that I don't think that Russians would have anticipated. Well, you, you've studied Putin for decades, and you've, you've met him many times. Yep. You, you say in the book, again, there is nothing for you here, that you, you write about sitting next to him at a dinner. How, A, why would Putin let someone who studies Putin sit next to him <laughs> at a dinner, and what's his dinner conversation like? Is it... Light and sparkly? Is he flirty? Yeah. What's he like? Well, <laughs> as you can imagine, it's pretty sparse. And the most disturbing thing of sitting next to him at dinner, and he actually was at this side right here, 
was that he didn't eat or drink anything. So that's why I'm not touching that cup of water, because, you know, <laughs> you, I, I don't know what you've put in it. So he clearly doesn't even trust... Not even water? Yeah, he doesn't even trust his own, you know, water and, and, and tea that's there. Tea, probably, you know, we can think about putting the polonium in the tea for the former spy in London. Good mm -hmm. reason for that. Was but, that the polonium in the sushi? Well, it could have been. It was in the tea in okay. London. But it, he could think it's in everything. I mean, given, you know, the, the risks uh, did inherent... You, did you talk to him? Sort of. Uh, the, the thing that I could see is, like, you have on your desk here your notes. Now, yours are in very small font. His are in enormous font, so I could see them. And he wasn't wearing glasses, and I was close enough to see that he wasn't wearing contact lenses. Mm. So, basically, like most of us, certainly me, I mean, I can't read what you've got on there, but I could read his notes, because they were about that big in terms of the font. Mm -hmm. So, the one thing I noticed was he's short-sighted. Hey, wow. you know, he's not the Superman that we think of. So, you, you can't read my card? I can't read your card, so You can't no. see this. says, I can't, get I can't her to see. drink the tea. Yeah, get her to drink the tea. <laughs> <laughs> Now, do you think that there's any fear of his own oligarchs? You know, like, because there's no honor among thieves, and if he shows weakness, they could turn on him. I don't think it's really the oligarchs so much as the people in his inner circle. Mm. So the people who have come up with this plan of invading Ukraine with him, let's just say, first of all, it's not the Russian people, mm -hmm. and it's not all the people in Russian business, but it's a very small circle of people that include the head of intelligence, for example, the head of the military, all of these security services. And these are not the kind of guys who have yachts off Monaco, uh, basically palaces in Paris or anything like this. These are people who are very much rooted in Russia itself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're too worried about all of these sanctions and everything that's cut off because they're not invested in the West. They've got, really got that bunker siege mentality of fortress Russia. And they're the people he probably does have to worry about, because if this war doesn't go well, if it looks like Russia is losing, I don't think they care about the, the world of public opinion. But if there's not uh, any movement on the ground, if that great convoy of uh, tanks just basically runs out of gas and is just left there and, you know, they have to move further... I mean, if they have to kind of lay waste to Ukraine to basically get a success, that's already going to be the kind of problem. So you might then start to get a backlash from those people who are thinking this has not gone as they intended. Now, you've said in, in another interview that, you know, he doesn't build weapons not to use them, so it is, it is, it is conceivable that he would use a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, putting that aside, that is the impetus for this question is, what off-ramp is there for Putin shy of actually taking and holding Ukraine? Because that seems unlikely, given the success of his army so far and the size of his military, that they can hold that space. What can he get shy of Ukraine and the West saying, OK, take Ukraine, that will allow him to leave and save face? Yeah, that's the real problem that we have right now. We're going to have to think long and hard about how we structure, first of all, discussions and negotiations, which we can't in the middle of a massive invasion, because we want to see the pullback from Ukraine and the withdrawal of all of the forces, not just the pullback from hostilities. The problem is, just as you've laid it out, that Putin wants us to take an off-ramp. He wants full capitulation, surrender. He's already said that. He told the Ukrainian military to lay down their arms and even overthrow President Zelensky and their government. Clearly, that's not happening. So he's going to want to take as much territory as he possibly can and then try to basically have a negotiation that leaves him in charge of as much of Ukraine as he can possibly have. And that is unacceptable. So we are going to have to be thinking about how we try to get some pressure on him to find a way out of this that we're all going to have to figure out. And I think, honestly, one of the few ways that we might be able to get to him is if, for example, President Xi and the Chinese actually expressed some kind of displeasure. But that seems a pretty long shot as well. Well, um, Fiona, thank you so much for being here. The book is There Is Nothing For You Here. It's available now. Fiona Hill, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back.